Most of us interact with injection molded components every single day. In fact, you might be watching this video on a device with injection molded parts right now and not even realize it. But how are these parts, ranging from disposable spoons to life-saving medical devices like the ones behind me, actually manufactured using injection molding? And what does this seemingly simple but also incredibly complex process really look like? Well, let's start with the basics and work our way up to some of those more complex life-saving medical devices I mentioned, like the ones we manufacture here at Crescent Industries. The surface level process is fairly simple and involves four steps. First is clamping, where an injection molding machine clamps two halves of a mold together so that the molten plastic that will be introduced in the next step doesn't flow outside the mold cavity. Once the two halves of the mold are properly clamped together, step two can begin, which is known as injection. In this step, small pellet-shaped pieces of plastic are melted down, and once this plastic has melted to just the right viscosity, it's rapidly pushed into the mold cavity by the injection molding machine. Once the mold cavity is filled, step three begins, which is the cooling stage, where that molten plastic is given just enough time to cool down and solidify into the final shape of the finished part. After the plastic has cooled enough that it will hold its final shape, step four begins, which is ejection, where the two halves of the mold are separated and the final part is ejected from the mold. And once the finished part has been ejected, this process then loops back to step one where the mold halves are clamped together and the entire process is repeated. Again, on the surface, it's fairly simple. Clamp the mold together, inject it with plastic, allow the plastic to cool, and eject the finished part. But if you're watching this video, then you probably know that injection molding is typically way more complicated than that, and if making a finished part was truly that simple, then Crescent wouldn't have been a leader in the injection molding industry for the past 75 years. So what makes it so complicated, and why is it so important to have an experienced molder in your corner when trying to bring your plastic component to market? Well, during Step one, pressing the two halves of the mold together with just the right amount of force is crucial. Too much force and you risk trapping gases in the mold cavity, resulting in a short shot or potentially damaging the costly mold itself. Not enough pressure and the molten plastic will flow outside the mold cavity, causing a common defect known as flash. If you want to learn more about common injection molding defects specifically, many of which we'll mention today, then you can check out this video. Now, step two of our seemingly simple process, injection, is by far the most complicated. Yes, plastic is melted and injected into the mold, but like I mentioned earlier, you have to get that molten plastic to just the right viscosity in order to create laminar flow during the injection process. The mold also needs to be designed in a way where the molten plastic can easily reach all spaces within the mold and properly vent the air as the plastic comes in. Ignore these variables and many other others and you'll get burn marks, bubbles, splay, and overall a low quality, inconsistent finished part. You'll also need to consider the speed at which the plastic is being injected, the temperature of the mold itself, since they're typically cooled with water or heated with oil, the type of plastic being injected, the type of metal used to make the injection mold itself, not to mention that all of these variables we've discussed are a constantly moving target that can change from one cycle to the next. But assuming we've accounted for all of those variables and we've successfully injected plastic into the mold cavity, we now have to carefully navigate step three cooling. The mold temperature I just mentioned is again very important here, but other variables like hold time and hold pressure are crucial during this cooling phase since they ensure that the liquid plastic fills the entire mold as we move from injection to cooling. And this prevents sink marks among other defects from forming as the part cools. But you also don't want to hold a finished part in the mold too long unnecessarily as even fractions of a second in cycle time can compound tremendously when we're talking about millions of parts being manufactured. It's a very precise balance of making the parts as fast and efficiently as possible while ensuring that the part quality is held to a consistently high standard. Now, assuming that we've navigated all three of those seemingly simple steps, we now just have to remove the part from the mold, right? Well, as you may have guessed, even step four, ejection, can be more complicated than simply pushing the part out of the mold. Ejector pins are the most common method used, which will protrude from the mold cavity once the two halves are separated, but these ejector 
Vector pins don't work in all applications, and they can leave permanent marks on the surface of the finished part. The next time you use plastic cutlery, just take a close look at the back and you'll see these small circular marks that I'm talking about. In the world of cutlery, that may not be a big deal, but with many of the life-saving medical devices that we manufacture here at Crescent, we sometimes need to be a bit more precise. That's where ejection methods like stripper plates, lifters, robotic end-of-arm tooling, and a number of other ejection methods are implemented to meet the specific requirements of each individual component. Get this wrong, and you may still end up with a part that doesn't meet the required quality standards. And as if all of that wasn't enough, it's also worth noting here that everything we've talked about thus far is greatly impacted by the mold design, which begins long before a mold is ever in a press producing parts. The way that that mold is designed, including where the parting line is placed, the type of ejection system that is used, the types of metals that are used in the mold, the maintenance schedule that is implemented, and many other variables have just as much impact on the finished parts as the injection molding process itself. So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed at this point, then I think the point I'm trying to make is very clear. Injection molding may seem like a fairly simple process, but it is actually much more complex, especially when you get into the medical, pharmaceutical, dental, and defense industries that Crescent predominantly serves. And the craziest part is that all we've talked about thus far is fairly simple injection molded components. Even after molding is completed, many components require over molding or insert molding, adding a whole new layer of complexity. Other post-processing steps include part decoration methods such as pad printing, laser etching, or inkjet printing, all of which add 2D graphics to the exterior of a molded part. Or what if you have multiple plastic components that all need to be assembled together? Well, we could ultrasonically weld them together, use UV bonding, there's also fasteners, all of which have pros and cons. And on top of all of that, consider that many injection molding components, especially in those industries I just mentioned, have strict sterile requirements, meaning everything we've discussed thus far may need to occur inside of a class seven or class eight clean room facility that meets strict regulations. Needless to say, injection molding is way more complicated than clamping two pieces of metal together, injecting them with plastic, allowing it to cool, and ejecting the finished part. There are endless variables to consider, and that's why having an experienced injection molder in your corner who can not only make your plastic components, but do so reliably, all while advising you on the best, most efficient manufacturing methods is crucial for the long-term success of your program. And naturally, as a family-owned injection molder with over 75 years in this industry, we like to think that we are a pretty experienced injection molder ourselves. So if you have any questions, then be sure to reach out to us using the contact information down below and learn how we can help bring your injection molded part to life.